Good morning, everyone. Greetings and welcome to the Sunday New York Times read along. We are delighted that you could join us as we read the Sunday print edition of the New York Times. We've been doing this for more than five years. Please tell us where you're watching from and tell us how your Sunday is going. My name is Sri Srinivasan and I am honored to be part of the team that brings you the New York Times read along every single Sunday. Today we have a fabulous guest, Linda Amster is with us, longtime researcher for the New York Times. She worked closely on the Pentagon Papers, did research for the coverage of the moon landing and wrote the Saturday Night News Quiz, among many other achievements. You'll meet her in just a few minutes. Please share this with your friends and family and tell us where you're watching from. I know they would love to catch this. They can watch this live or later. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Please tag a friend right now. Please hit share and please tell us about your Sunday and tell us where you're watching from. Jonathan Borstein's with us saying hello from the East Village. And Gunther is watching from Vienna, Austria. Welcome. And Stefan Kaplan is here from Ramsey, New Jersey and saying good morning to the New York Times read along family. And I love his picture there with the pride flag. Doug Levy is watching from Northern California, folks. It's not, it's 5.30 in the morning. And there he is, former guest on this show. And Miriam Berkeley is here. Good morning. As usual, I'm watching from Hell's Kitchen in New York City. I was around when the Pentagon Papers came out. Very interested in today's show uh, and all of our programs. Thank you, Miriam. And Diane says, good morning from a gorgeous day in Margate, New Jersey. That's right. It's a fabulous day in New York in the New York City area. For those of you who don't know the Pentagon Papers, we'll explain what they were and why they're such an important part, not just of media history, but of American history. Paula Kiger is watching from Tallahassee, Florida, part of our production team. And Charo is watching from Florida. Uh, greetings, Charo, welcome. Everyone, please hit share, please tag a friend and have them join us. We know they will enjoy watching this show. Richard's uh, here with us. Richard is Linda's nephew from Fort Lauderdale. So proud of her. So that's great. I'm glad Richard is with us. Dr. Ch Sanjita Chandrasekhar is with us. Hot day, hot show, she says. She is part of She's On Call, the show that we produce after this at 11 a.m. Eastern. Please stay tuned for that. And Patricia is with us. And Patricia is viewing from New York. And Carla Baranakis, part of our read-along family. Good morning from New Jersey. Everything is legal in New Jersey, a line from Hamilton. So everyone, please tag and hit share and bring your friends along so they can watch and learn as we talk about so many aspects of this particular story and of course the news today and so much more. This is part of a twofer that we're gonna be doing for the 50th anniversary of the Pentagon Papers. Today we have Linda Amster and next week we have Hedrick Smith next Sunday. So these are two folks who will bring very important perspectives about this very important Vietnam archive, which really changed the way we understood what happened in Vietnam. And so today we're meeting Linda Amster and next Sunday, June 13th is Hedrick Smith. So first, let me just say hello to everyone. And I know uh, all of you are looking forward to hearing from Neil, our executive producer. Uh, Neil's on assignment, as they say, and is not able to be with us today. But we do want to thank Neil for setting up this show as he always does and for being part of the team that makes this all possible. So first, let me thank our team and all the incredible things they do for us. Neil is our executive producer at Neil Parikh. Paula Kiger in Tallahassee is at Big Green Pen. Steve Taylor is at Steve DeReeve in Philadelphia. Julia Weeks at Julia L. Weeks in Brooklyn and Carla Baranakis at Kabara in New Jersey. And you will see them annotate and live tweet and share what's happening and really 
helps the show stand out from lots of other shows you see online. This is all produced by our company, DigiMentors. And if you would like to have a show like this for yourself, uh, we produce them for you. We do conferences, summits, social media, digital consulting. Just contact me, Sri at Sri.net or Neil at DigiMentors.group. And we also want to thank our sponsors, Muckrack, for being such great su supporters of this show. And if you would like to be a sponsor, please get in touch with us. Muckrack is a product and service that every PR person and every journalist uh, should know and should use. So please check them out. So are you ready to talk about the news? Are you ready to meet Linda Amster as we talk about the Pentagon Papers? We'll bring her to you in just a minute. But first, I just want to show you all a little bit of the paper laid out here, as you can see. And we have uh, the New York Times Magazine cover is of Kevin Durant and the New York Nets. So if you're a basketball fan, you will be interested in that. The New York Times book review cover is summer reading. Always fun to see that. Here's what's going on with the mayoral race in the metropolitan section. The real estate cover is about skyscrapers grow sideways. Uh, we see them grow certainly to the sky here in New York, but they're growing sideways apparently. And this is an unusual cover of the New York Times Sunday Review, the opinion section, the making of a doctor, Emma Goldberg, who's an editorial assistant on the opinion pages, uh, has written a book about doctors, young students or who are young graduates who had who finished their medical studies early to go on the front lines of COVID. And the Sunday business cover is the cost of being an interchangeable Asian. And in many workplaces, Asian Americans face slights and inequities because colleagues fail to tell them apart. And we have certainly seen that uh, with multiple races that happens. And Sunday Styles, end of the wonder rug. After nearly a century, the Karastan factory shuts down and how Cabby Lane took over TikTok, a 21-year-old in Italy with the exasperated everyman quality is raking in the clicks. And one more section here to show you, the arts and leisure cover is heading for the heights. The actor Anthony Ramos, a veteran of Hamilton, is not a household name, but a star turn in a film version of another Lin-Manuel Miranda musical could change that. And that's for In the Heights, which is coming out very soon. And so that should be interesting. Uh, so that's your look at the various front sections, front pages of the various sections. And we'll just glance at the front page, front page of the New York Times here. Lead story, historic shift in labor force favors workers. Record job vacancies, employees offer better pay training and opportunities. Department of Justice was pressurized by Trump aid. Emails reveal push on false election claims. This is about Mark Meadows. And an interesting set of pictures here about proms and how they're resilient, as they're as resilient as teenagers themselves. My twin teens uh, who are graduating from high school in a couple of weeks are preparing for their prom next week. As US ditches masks, Europe stays cautious and Billions in aid, but the migrants keep coming. So this is above the fold in the New York Times. And Amsterdam is crumbling. Wow, that's a shocking headline. The city has begun a two-decade project to shore up its sagging bridges and canal walls. Medicine for Alzheimer's poses a dilemma for US regulators. And G7 finance leaders reach a deal to curb offshore tax havens. So luck. Lots going on in the paper, and we will uh, talk about the news and so much more after we uh, get to meet Linda. So I'm going to bring her on screen right now. Um, we uh, Hold on. We had Linda, but we just lost her. So we'll wait for her to rejoin screen. She was here. We talked. We're all set, but she dropped out. So I know she'll be coming back, uh, and you'll get to uh, get to meet her in just a minute. Meanwhile, let's see who else is watching and let's say hello to uh, various folks who are, uh, who are with us here today.
And let me just take a look and look at the various comments. Thank you all for joining us and for saying hello. Kalpana uh, Mohan is watching from Singapore. Hi, Kalpana, welcome. And uh, Paula is making sure you have my email address. And uh, Rob is watching from central New Jersey. Hi, Rob. And we have uh, the Young Docs piece that Sujana mentioned says is very interesting today. And of course, that's something that she's uh, interested in. We have a viewer on LinkedIn from Eastern Europe. Uh, great to have you here with us. Ellen is watching from New York City. Uh, looking forward to this. Here. Uh, and Paula says, Anthony Ramos is already famous uh, for us Hamilton fans. He certainly is. Uh, Ellen says, uh, Krishna and Durga graduating from high school. I must have linked. <laughs> Congratulations to them. Yes. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is that the days are short, but the years, uh, the years are long, but the days are short. And that's how it feels uh, to have twins already graduating. Uh, folks, we're just waiting for uh, Linda Amster to join us. Uh, she was just here. Uh, her connection dropped out and I'm sure she'll be back. We'll continue reading the paper until she's able to join us. Elizabeth says, I'm looking forward so much to this broadcast. Very important issue. Thank you. Eve Botello says, good morning from Charlotte, North Carolina. And Rachel Cooper says she's very interested to hear today's program. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel and everyone for joining us. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sri. Uh, we are uh, going to be talking about various aspects of the news, including the 50th anniversary of the Pentagon Papers. And we have a two-part series for you. Uh, today, Sunday, we're going to be meeting Linda Amster. And then next Sunday, we will be meeting Hedrick Smith, uh, another New York Times journalist whose byline many of you know. And we'll be talking about why the Pentagon matter papers matter and why they're so important. And special greetings to Linda's family and friends who have joined us. We'll be, uh, we're just waiting for her to rejoin us online. She was with us and we were talking and all set. And just as I was about to go to her, we, the connection dropped out. So um, I know that uh, our friend Carla is working uh, to make sure that she can uh, join us. So we'll, we'll, we'll see her in just a few minutes. In the meantime, um, and in the meantime, I'm just going to uh, pull up the, the New York Times camera here that I have, and we'll, we'll read the paper together while we await uh, Linda's arrival. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Please tag your friends. Please tell them that they'll be meeting Linda Amster in just a few minutes. And so let's go to the paper and uh, take a look, see what's in it. <clears throat> So the, we read the front page. We looked at the historic shift in labor force for uh, favoring workers for the first time. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if the labor force uh, was, uh, was uh, always favoring workers? Wouldn't that be a nice thing? And it would, that it wouldn't take a pandemic for that to be the case. And um, we are just waiting for Linda to join us. As soon as she calls in, uh, we will bring her to you. In the meantime, I'll just keep reading the paper. And uh, we are just looking inside the front, in, inside section of the paper. Uh, here's a headline from history in 1946 on this day in the paper. Blind girl guided to safety by dog. When a fire erupted in Chicago's LaSalle Hotel just after midnight on John June 5th, Anita Blair, a blind woman who lived on the 11th floor, awakened to hysteria. Her guide dog, Fawn, along with hotel guest, helped lead Blair, 23, to the fire escape, where, following the dog, she climbed down 11 flights to safety. The Times reported Fawn had been nervous and apparently blinded by smoke, but once in the, on the landing, Fawn calmed down completely, Blair said. It's one of the worst hotel fires in history. 61 people died. And so the Times was able to pull out a human interest angle there. And uh, we are going to have Linda join us. I see her backstage. So she's here and we'll go to her in just a minute. So let me 
uh, stop looking at the paper. We'll come back to the paper as we always do. But Linda is here, so I'm going to put the card here and bring her on stage. So let me say hi uh, to Linda. Hi, Linda. Hello. Sorry for that uh, little technical glitch. That's okay. That's uh, tech troubles are part of, uh, of the way these things work. So we're just so happy to have you with us. Thank you for uh, being here and thank you for your time. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's a glorious thing to be your celebrating time. the 50th we go. Hello. Um, there I am. Well, it's great yes, to be here are. to celebrate. Can you hear me? We can. Can you hear we me? We can hear you. Oh, okay. Yes, we can. Okay, I'm delighted to be able to inaugurate the Times 50th anniversary celebration of the publication of the Pentagon Papers. It was a most fascinating time in my life, and I'm glad that it's being recognized this, this year. Yeah, it's a, such an important part of our history. I was saying not just media history, but American history. And before we get into that, first, let me just welcome you to the show. And my first question to our guest is always, how are you? How are you handling the pandemic? I know you're a neighbor of mine on the Upper West Side in Manhattan. Yes. Uh, well, it's wonderful to say that we hope, fingers crossed, that we are all handling the pandemic beautifully. New York City responded so well that we are now eating in restaurants. We are walking the streets, mostly without masks. There's a sense of uh, freedom that we haven't had for over a year, as you know. So uh, I personally had COVID in November, but luckily a mild case of it. And so uh, that was fortunate for me. And of course, I'm fully recovered. And it's a joy to have uh, activity on the streets again. Yes, it, it really is. Uh, and it's uh, we are very proud of how New York handled all of this. I'm sorry to hear you had COVID, but I'm so glad that uh, you were able to over, overcome it and, uh, and be with us here today. Uh, so let's give some context to folks about your work uh, as a researcher. Uh, tell us about you know, your career, how you started there, and then we'll make our way to the Pentagon Papers. Okay, well, I, I had graduated from college and was an English teacher in high school, and then moved uh, around and wound up uh, in Detroit and decided I didn't want to be a teacher. So looked at the classified ads and found one for a job at the Detroit News. That sounded interesting. So I went and applied, and it turned out to be a job for which I was overqualified. So it happened that they were going to have an opening in the library for which I was qualified. And uh, I went and got a job as a researcher on their questions and answers page. That was a, a public service where they would answer any question that the public called in as long as it didn't take more than five minutes to find the answer. So I was put in front of a reference collection and studied it for a few weeks. And then my boss said, okay, now get on the line and answer questions. I was very nervous and I picked up the phone and said questions and answers and a very agitated male voice said, where can I get married in a hurry? <laughs> Which was a very easy answer. <laughs> so I relaxed and I did that for a couple of years. Then my boss suggested, since I was moving to New York, that I apply at the New York Times, which never would have occurred to me. And I did, and they said, we have no openings. So I went to library school at Columbia, thinking I must get a degree in library science in order to work at the New York Times. And lo and behold, um, I got a degree, but halfway through, I got a telegram from the Times that they were starting a research department. Telegram? And would I please... Um, uh, apply for it, and I did, and I got the job. So that was the beginning of the research staff at the New York Times. It's an interesting story because, of course, this was pre-feminist, and um, there were almost no women working in the newsroom of the New York Times. 
And all of the new researchers were young, attractive women. Now, why was that? Well, <laughs> because the man named John Rothman, who was, I think, uh, the unsung hero of uh, electronic news uh, gathering, um, had decided that he wanted to make the New York Times coverage available by computer. And he knew that if he did that, he needed to integrate it into the newsroom to these male reporters and editors who were used to doing their own legwork. And the only way he'd be able to do that is with some attractive young women in the newsroom. So he installed a staff in the newsroom and the managing editor, Clifton Daniel, ordered every single male, well, all of the reporters and editors to use research. They had to, it was a mandate. And so they did, and we passed the trial period and became a permanent department in the newsroom. I, I'm, what an interesting story that is. And uh, did, you know, now when we look back to say that that's how they uh, incentivized the men to use it, all of that sounds so ridiculous, but what was it like at that time? How aware were you about the sexism and aspects of this? And what was it like to be a female employee there? Well, actually, it wasn't until recently when I was preparing for this appearance that I thought back and said, wow, that was at such an, a time when there was no feminist movement. It was just a natural thing. I, I didn't even think about why we were hired and why. And, and John was very clever. There were no, almost no women in the newsroom. There was a woman's department called Family Furnishings, uh, Food, and um, Fashion, the four Fs. That was a department, but it was not in the newsroom. It was in a separate area of the, of the, of the Times. But there were only a few in the newsroom. That was just the way things were. And it didn't occur to me until now how, do, how now the newsroom is filled with women and, and executives, but not at the time I was hired. Yeah, the, the, the CEO leadership, uh, we've had a female top editor at the Times. Uh, we've, uh, so it, things, have, things have changed over time. So let's talk about the Pentagon Papers. If you can set that up for us, why, is this, why was this such an important episode in American history, and then we'll talk about your involvement in the Times' coverage. Well, um, I, I also want to say that I was the first woman, not a reporter or editor, but the first woman, quote, executive, who was made uh, an excluded employee in the newsroom. That was also part of the feminist movement. Now there are, the masthead has women executives on it, but at my time, there were none until uh, they appointed me to that. Well, can you explain what exclude, non-excluded or excluded, what does that mean? Well, it, almost everyone who works in the newsroom of the Times on the news staff is part of the newspaper guild. They are guild. The union, the union that run, that's part of yes, the Times. That's correct. Very few other people who have managerial or executive roles cannot be part of the union. They are made non-union. They are called excluded from the union. That uh, gives extra perks and so on. And so we are out of the union and have a different uh, role in the, in the newspaper. Got it. So you were uh, setting up the Pentagon Papers for us. The Pentagon Papers, I know mo a lot of your audience is f familiar with it from having lived through it or learned about it, but it was a great, great expose of the history of the war in Vietnam the, that the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, commissioned from the Pentagon staff. He wanted to know how the New York, how the, Depart the United States got mired in this terrible war. And he wanted the history of it. So he commissioned it. And uh, eventually there were 7,000 
thousand pages of the papers. Three thousand were narrative that his researchers put together. The other four thousand were the documents on which they based the narrative. And a man named Daniel Ellsberg, who had been a, a, in Vietnam, served in Vietnam, and later was a pacifist and had worked at the Pentagon, managed to copy the 7,000 pages. He tried to get McGovern and other major congressmen to expose it, but they wouldn't. So he, in desperation, turned to the New York Times and he went to a man named Neil Sheehan, who also a reporter who had served in Vietnam and was anti-Vietnam, had most recently written book reviews about books on Vietnam. And Ellsberg read the reviews and he called Neil and he shared the fact that he had the Pentagon papers. Neil went to Cambridge where Ellsberg lived and agreed to read the papers. And surreptitiously, he and his wife photocopied the papers when Ellsberg was away and brought them to the New York Times, which of course was riveted by them and decided they would publish the Pentagon Papers. And they brought in a staff, initially just of, of Neil and a few other people and then me as a researcher who would go through the Pentagon Papers and prepare it for preparation. Eventually that small staff turned into 40 plus people, all of us sequestered at the Hilton Hotel. The rest of the newsroom knew we were disappearing but had no idea where we were. And it was a top secret in a, a project. Of all of them, I was the only one who remained in headquarters because as the researcher for the Pentagon Papers, I had to use the resources that were located in the Times building. So I would be in a locked office with files and books from our library, answering questions, doing research, while everyone else slowly disappeared from the newsroom into the Hilton Hotel. And I would go back and forth between the headquarters and the Hilton, bringing answers to questions. So I had a rather unique experience. Well, let's show people, the, there's a picture here of the hotel that, uh, that they, were, they were in, right? And tell us what this picture, who this is a picture of. This is our hero. This is Neil Sheehan, who was the person who got the Pentagon Papers to the attention of the Times and was the first reporter. Originally, he was going to be the only reporter of the Pentagon Papers, but it was way too big a project for him to do single-handedly. So three other reporters were brought on board and many more um, under a, a very spy-like conditions. I was in the newsroom at my desk and suddenly Jim Greenfield, who was the new editor of the foreign news desk, came down and said, follow me and turned and marched to the front of the newsroom. I got up from my desk and followed him through an acre of a smoke-filled room to the front where the uh, bigwigs had desks. And he par put me in front of Peter Malonis, who was the assistant managing editor. Peter got up, they both got, one got on either side of me. Without a word, they marched me out of the newsroom, down to the lobby, through the lobby, out the door to a waiting taxi. We got into the taxi again without any words except Peter saying Hilton Hotel. Naturally, I was extremely curious what was going on, but kept my mouth shut. We got to the Hilton, we got out, they marched me through the lobby, they put me in the elevator, they pressed the button for the 11th floor, we got out, they marched me to a room 1109, and believe it or not, they did a secret knock on the door. I was amazed the door opened and i don't know if you have a slide of the people behind the door 
but I recognize, no, that's not it. I'm sorry. They recognized three, I recognized three men. One, two of them, one of them was Jim Greenfield, the foreign editor who had taken me there. Two others were uh, Al Siegel and Jerry Gold. Both of them were major editors on the foreign desk. And I knew them, of course. And the third was the picture you saw of a man I didn't know who turned out to be Neil Sheehan, who worked at uh, in the Washington Bureau. And he was, as I said, the main source. Thank you for and sharing I, this and all these. I was. And all these names that you're you're mentioning, I'll just told, give I'll just give you finally. Jim said, I, I guess you want to know why you're here. <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, well, we have Hi, uh, Linda. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I know the the, the connection's a little bit spotty, but uh, but thank you again for sharing these stories. I'll just give you two connections to some of the names you mentioned. Peter Malonis was my main professor at Columbia Journalism School in 1992, 93. So that's many years later. And Jimmy Greenfield and I had the chance to work together as he was bringing uh, f free press to Eastern Europe after the fall of uh, the uh, of the Berlin Wall, and so I had a chance to work in Eastern Europe and Central Europe uh, on a couple of projects with him. So that was great to uh, hear those names. Um, I know we're having some tech difficulties, but we will bring Linda back on in just a minute. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. This is part of our two-part look at the Pentagon Papers. It's the 50th anniversary. This report that was the kind of secret history of what America did in Vietnam is very important for us to understand uh, things like government overreach, uh, uh, going headlong into war, uh, and uh, what the government knows when people in power, how they use information, what they share, when they share it, all of that uh, is so important. Uh, and can be found in understanding the history of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, some of you also have seen uh, the movie called The Post about another aspect of the Pentagon Papers, which was the Washington Post's coverage. Uh, part of the uh, revelations were in The Post, and r editor Ben Bradley and publisher uh, Catherine Graham uh, that's their story about how they decided to publish the Pentagon Papers in the Washington Post. That's what that movie is about. Today, we're talking to Linda Amster uh, about uh, the New York Times and her role in the Pentagon Papers. And then on June 13th, which is the actual 50th anniversary, Hedrick Smith will be with us to talk about the papers and what they mean and why they are so important. So we'll be joined by Linda again in just a few minutes. Uh, we should tell you that uh, in addition to having worked on the Pentagon Papers, she did the research for the coverage of the moon landing and wrote the Saturday night quiz, Saturday news quiz for a long time. The, uh, the quiz was off the papers for several decades, but is now back in the last couple of years. And uh, we'll talk to her about that. We'll also look here at how this was when on June 30th, 1971, the Supreme Court upholds newspapers' right to publish the Pentagon report, and Times resumes its series had halted for 15 days. And she also was uh, part of the team that got to cover the man, man walking on the moon, which is an incredible story. And we'll hear from her in just a few minutes about that. So welcome, everybody. I'm Sri. Thank you for being here. Uh, we read the Sunday New York Times out loud. We've been doing it for five and a half years, and we're so grateful to everyone 
who watches every Sunday and for sharing, tag your friends, they can watch us live or watch us later. So let's get back to looking at the paper. I have it arrayed here and then we'll bring on uh, Linda when she is able to join us. So uh, we looked at the front page already. We're just gonna go into the inside sections. Uh, one of the things that's happened uh, is that the Times has now stopped running the curated section called Tracking and Outbreak. That was what you would see in the print paper. Uh, they announced that as of last week, they are not doing that. The COVID coverage is going into the respective sections, international, national, et cetera. And that's because the virus has subsided in America, but not, of course, in the rest of the world. And even in America, there's still thousands of cases every day. Lavish parties for the rich, a COVID outbreak for the poor. And this is in Bangkok slums pay a price for the actions of a privileged few. And this is from Thailand. And this is a market in Klong Toi, Bangkok's largest slum. COVID-19 has surged as a cluster of cases in Bangkok nightclubs spread to crowded areas where social distancing is all but impossible. And here's the standard ad now from Facebook asking for regulation. Uh, they want to preempt what the government might do. As U.S. ditches masks, EU favors a more cautious path forward. And are you still wearing masks? Uh, let us know in the comments. We'll just take a look at the comments and uh, see who all are watching uh, with us. Um, Diana is watching, uh, tuning in from a yurt on the top of a mountain in Santa Cruz, California. Even in the mountains, your show is a must for me. Thank you, Diana. And Diana was featured in a Washington Post story about uh, how people are uh, dressing for and past the pandemic. Uh, Macron says, greetings for World Environment Day. Macron's watching from New York City. Is that today? Um, and uh, that's, uh, he, and Patricia was saying, congrats on being a woman of history and uh, hashtag women execs. And let's see, uh, uh, Macron said, never heard of the Pentagon Papers while researching resilience. That's why we have to do this story. Rahajan is catching a recording later. And Paul Knox says, uh, is, uh, is saying hello. We are trying to fix her tech issues, folks. Uh, uh, I'm really glad that you're all with us and she'll be joining us soon. Laura Silverman is watching from Philadelphia, former guest of the show. One wonders what today's Supreme Court might judge in a sim similar case, uh, says uh, Miriam Berkeley. I wouldn't be too optimistic. Uh, and uh, Ted Coltman's watching from Washington, D.C. And uh, Laura was uh, uh, was at a Wear Orange Day event outdoors yesterday. All wore masks, and Wear Orange is part of gun awareness, gun violence awareness. Brain ailment mystifies Canadian doctors. Debilitating neurological symptoms in dozens of patients have shaken New Brunswick. And so... That's the story from there. Nigeria bans use of Twitter after it's, it pulls leaders' posts. So the president of Nigeria, his post was threatening violence against rebels, was pulled by Twitter, and then the Twitter was banned by Nigeria. I'm sure other strongmen are looking at that uh, and to see what they would do. The other news, uh, we just we had talked about Facebook for a second. Uh, the face the Facebook has announced that they are banning uh, Donald Trump for two years uh, from Facebook. Uh, of course, that means it'll be past the 2022 midterm elections, but just in time for the 2024 run that he is seems determined to do uh, as uh, running for president. They were vaccinated, but the university doesn't accept that vaccine. This is about international students coming to the U.S. and how uh, various vaccines, including those in India, aren't accepted here. So they may not have time to get the vaccine, get the visas, all of that. Uh, I didn't know uh, that there is a North American Association of Indian Students. Uh, India is the second largest uh, sender of um, uh, students to America after China. And uh, the, the two biggest countries are China and then India. There are about 200,000 international students in the U.S. Burkina Faso, Burkina Faso leaves, attack leaves 
uh, at least 100 dead in a village there. And Hotel Rwanda dissidents said to be denied food. So if you have uh, seen that movie, Hotel Rwanda, uh, this is about an update about that story. And it's Pride Month. LGBTQ hope dims as Tokyo Olympics near old prejudices block a rights bill in Japan. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the Olympics. They're starting in 50 days. Those booms you hear are canals and bridges crumbling. This is in Amsterdam. Anybody been to Amsterdam recently? Is this uh, an accurate uh, feeling of what's happening there? Uh, and let's see, Naomi Service is watching. Greetings from the Upper West Side. Very few people at Center Mark Park this morning were masked. And more seem more relaxed around being around other massless people. And Paula was in a Wear Orange event also. And... Uh, and she's linked to wearorange.com, uh, which will help you understand what folks are trying to do with this. Oh, the Tribeca Film Festival is back June 9th through 20th. So that's exciting. Always good to see things uh, back on track. Even with billions in USAID, the migrants keep coming. And uh, this is a story about what's uh, what's happening as they try to prevent Central American migrants coming here. The national section, urban climbing claimed his PTSD, but may land him in prison. So this is somebody who climbs buildings and bridges and things like that. Thank you all for uh, joining us. We are uh, waiting the return of Linda Amster as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the publication of the Pentagon Papers. And Linda will be with us in just a second. And uh, uh, you're my number one. Ocasio-Cortez uh, endorses Wiley for mayor of New York. So as you may know, there are lots of candidates running for mayor. And this is the cover of the Metropolitan section. And AOC has endorsed Maya Wiley, former civil rights lawyer who is proposing a deal uh, a new deal for New York. And she worked for uh, Mayor de Blasio for many years. All right, I see that Linda is coming backstage. We'll join you in just a minute, Linda. And this is a crazy story this week. As California judge overturns weapons ban, I turns, eyes turn to Supreme Court. A provocative ruling likened AR-15 rifles to Swiss Army knives. Uh, just insane that this is the situation in America and a judge in California, federal judge in California, uh, presumably a Republican, uh, have voted, I mean, ruled that. And these are two pages of pictures about proms. I was saying earlier that my twins are 18 and they're having their prom next week. A teenage right evolves and perseveres. Uh, just, again, always good to see things going back to normal. And uh, top Trump aide press justice department over election. Embarking on next act, a diminished Trump keeps pushing on election lie. He had a, uh, a rally yesterday. And now we're looking at the obit section. Sofia Rivera, who photographed Puerto Rican New Yorkers, is dead at 82. That's her. She began taking luminous portraits of her neighbors in the late 1970s. Patrick Skye, 80, 60s folk singer who became a piper, songs that made America famous. And it was called the most politically incorrect folk album ever. I didn't know you could have politically incorrect folk albums. And Raymond Donovan, 90, labor secretary who quit under a cloud is dead, offering a retort after his acquittal. Which office do I go to get my reputation back? I've heard that, uh, and so uh, that was his line. Where do I go to get my reputation back? And uh, this is him with Robert Dole, uh, who uh, was uh, was labor. He was labor secretary, and Senator and Senator Dole was senator. Uh, senator Dole's wife was labor secretary later. Uh, folks, if you are interested in obits and paying tribute to loved ones, do check out Miss You Graham. M I S S hyphen U Graham. Uh, an app to uh, help folks uh, pay tribute to folks we've lost. Okay, before we go to the sports section, let me bring back Linda. 
uh, who is joining us, who's very patiently waiting backstage. Our guest is Linda Amster, longtime researcher for the New York Times. And uh, she worked on the Pentagon Papers, uh, the moon landing, wrote the Saturday News Quiz, and uh, she is here. So uh, welcome back, Linda. Thank you for being here, Linda. I'm so glad to be back. I'm so sorry about the technical problems. I don't know why. I am not a, a, a fan of technology. I, but uh, I certainly appreciate. Uh, I certainly appreciate it, except when it doesn't work. Um, should I continue where I left off? Or yeah, I'm sure. Let me let me just let me just to say a couple of quick things. One is that two names you mentioned resonated with me. Peter Malonis was my professor at Columbia Journalism School. And you mentioned him and Jimmy Greenfield and I got to work on a couple of projects in the late 90s, bringing the free press to Eastern Europe and Central Europe. And so uh, I'm glad you mentioned those, those names. You also had this uh, list. Tell us what this list is. Uh, uh, these are people allowed to enter room 9, 30, I think. That's right. This um, when the paper the, after the first installment was published, uh, we knew we were going to be in trouble. I was going to say that when I entered and I met Neil, Jim Greenfield said, uh, "Let me explain while you're here." And he told us that they had on the premises the secret history of the war in Vietnam. It was top secret. Uh, they wanted me to work on it, but understood that um, it was illegal for us to have it, and we might all go to prison if the FBI somehow um, uh, got hold of the news that we were in the Hilton Hotel and, and uh, came and uh, arrested us for holding top secret documents. So I was being warned that I didn't have to work on the Pentagon Papers for that reason, and my response was, show me the papers. And it was a two bedroom suite and Neil was in one bedroom and they opened the door to the suite and there were piles and piles and piles and piles of papers, which were the Pentagon Papers. This thing that I'm showing you now, uh, as soon as we published the first installment, it was clear that the government now knew that the New York Times had the Pentagon Papers. So a little, I was, I and the major reporters and all everyone who was working at the Hilton Hotel, by then about 40 people, were sent to the ninth floor of the headquarters with the Pentagon Papers. I personally took Pentagon Papers out of the Hilton Hotel in shopping bags, these top secret papers, and brought them to headquarters. And so did other people. So we were sequestered on the ninth floor in an office that belonged to uh, Quadrangle Books. And that shows the list of people who were permitted to go into the ninth floor offices and also a, the picture of the headquarters of the New York Times. So then we worked from inside headquarters. Uh, on the second day of publication, finally John Mitchell sent a they realized how damning the Pentagon Papers was going to be, and they set in motion uh, the restraining order to stop the, the paper from publishing any further, any further installments. And it was, and, when, and the paper stopped for 15 days. They stopped publishing, right. as we saw in this in this headline. Uh, and just going back to that list, you know, it's an incredible list. I see uh, Hedrick Smith, our guest from next week, will be uh, is here. Uh, he's, he's our guest on this show next week. Uh, I see your name, of course. I see Max Frankel, who'd go on to be the top editor of the paper, and uh, and so many other, Fox Butterfield, and other names that even after all of these years, some of us know. And uh, and and as I said, uh, Peter Malone is my professor, is uh, listed here as well. Al Siegel, who worked with you, uh, uh, is here. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about your book for which Al wrote an introduction. So it's a small world. This is the book called Kill Duck Before Serving, Red Faces at the New York Times, a collection of the most instructive, interesting, embarrassing corrections at the New York Times that Linda edited with Dylan McLean. So that, that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, let's get back to your story 
Uh, were you worried about when when they said the FBI might could arrest you? Did you have any hesitation on working on this? Not at all. As I said, my immediate response without a blinking was, show me the papers. I was game for it from the beginning. I could think of no greater honor than to be arrested <laughs> with the people who were working on the Pentagon Papers, including the publisher and so on. I could think of no greater honor than working on what would be an expose of how new, the United States got involved and mired in this terrible, terrible war. And silly me, I thought that the expose would lead to the end of the war because the Pentagon Papers started with the, with the Truman administration and the last part of the Pentagon Papers ended in 1968 in the Johnson administration when he announced that he would not run again for the presidency. And that last part of the Pentagon Papers <clears throat> then ended. So Nixon, I thought, would be thrilled because he could turn around and say, you see, I had nothing to do with it. It's all about, it's all about Johnson and you know, so on, and I'm gonna end the war. That was my expectation, silly me. I didn't realize that Nixon was not able to do that for his own psychological reasons. And thus began the, uh, the checking of how the Times, the leak to the Pentagon Papers and to the restraining order, keeping the Times from further publishing. When the Times could no longer publish, as you point out, John Mitchell, who was then Attorney General, um, uh, brought uh, a restraining order. The Washington Post picked up publication for two days and then they were restrained. It went to the Supreme Court, which upheld our right to publish the papers and we resumed the following day. And that's what we're looking at right now on the front page of the Times on July 1st is the day after the Supreme Court uh, upheld your right to publish the Pentagon report that you were able to do this. And uh, what an important moment. Uh, can you describe the feeling when you got the news of the Supreme Court verdict? Well, we were all elated because of course the freedom of the press was at stake. And if the court did not uphold this particular case, freedom of the press would be so severely damaged. But this was a landmark case about the right of newspapers to publish. The, um, the administration had said publishing would affect the security, the national security of the United States. That was the reason they brought the suit. And the Supreme Court ruled that there was not enough evidence to support that claim, and therefore that the papers could continue to publish. This was an amazing thing, which is actually relevant today with today's coverage of uh, the, the lawsuit against uh, the Times for, uh, or uh, the uh, uh, aborted lawsuit against the Times for, uh, the government wanted information on leaks to reporters of articles that had appeared. It was quashed this month by Biden, who earlier had upheld it. But uh, at any rate, the relevancy of the Pentagon Papers continues today. Um, very much, very much so. And that story you mentioned is so important, trying to understand how successive governments uh, have uh, gone after journalists. Uh, Miriam says, fascinating account from Linda. So thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And Linda, I, I know you have a couple of other uh, uh, photographs that you uh, brought along. So let's take a look. Uh, one is this picture. <laughs> this is after we won the Pulitzer, the day that we it was announced. I'm uh, flanked by Abe Rosenthal, who was the managing editor of the paper, and by the great Neil Sheehan, who is our hero, and by two other people who worked on the papers 
Muriel Stokes, who was the major secretary on the foreign desk, who was brought in immediately to, uh, to work with the reporters. And on the right, a wonderful woman um, named Gail Slater, who was a copy person who came. And as, there's a wonderful story about her because um, she was very attractive and young and she was working the way all of us did very late into the night, early in the morning till late in the evening. And she came back from dinner and was by herself and was walking to her to the office on the 11th floor when she was spotted by a security person from the Hilton Hotel who followed her down the corridor and stopped her and asked what she was there for. And she said, I'm working here. Well, that was a curious response. So he asked if he could see where she was working. And she led him to the office where the Pentagon Papers was truly being worked on. She opened the door and to his surprise, yes, there were typewriters, there were men working on, the, on something there. And of course, he apologized, thanked her and left. But as you can see from the from the uh, photograph, uh, he was suspicious that her work was of a different kind <laughs> in the Hilton Hotel late at night. So that's one of my favorite photographs. And it's great to see this picture here with you with Neil and with uh, Abe Rosenthal. I should mention that Abe Rosenthal's son, Andy Rosenthal, was a guest on this show uh, uh, a couple of months ago. He was the, uh, he would go on to be the uh, editorial uh, editor of the New York Times, edit, the editorial page editor of the New York Times. And so he, he told us some great stories about Abe as well. And then this picture is the Pulitzer uh, citation that you folks got. So let's just, uh, no, this is, this is Arthur, uh, is, this is Arthur Sulzberger, the publisher, uh, talking about the Pulitzer. The preparation and publication of the Pentagon Papers added up to one of the most important and proud episodes in the history of the New York Times. The entire project was built on the collective strength and skills and beliefs of the paper, but it was made possible only by the individual contributions of creativity and endeavor. This copy of the Pulitzer Medal for Public Service is a symbol of the paper's recognition and gratitude for your part. So this was, so all of you were given copies of this? There were only a dozen of these replicas made. I came to my desk a few months after we won the Pulitzer and found two manila envelopes, one with the replica of the medal framed and the other with uh, 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 this particular message from Punch, handwritten and signed by Arthur Ox Salzberger, known as Punch. So both of them are framed and hanging in my apartment and are sources of enormous pride. But he only had a dozen replicas made to give to the people he felt most contributed most to the preparation of the papers. Well, what a, you must be so proud of that. Uh, Patricia had a question here. How did this kind of work that you were doing uh, affect your friends and family? You must have been missing in action as you were doing all this work. That's a very good question. Um, I was married and I, I was sworn to secrecy, of course, immediately, and I kept that secret. I really felt it was an honor and an obligation to keep that secret. I didn't even tell my husband what I was working on. He knew, of course, that it was something very vital. My staff, unfortunately, I was whisked out of the newsroom in the middle of the afternoon, pledged my, my secrecy, and then returned to the newsroom, finished the day with my staff without saying a word about where I'd been for the last couple of hours, and then showed up at the Times, not with my staff again for a couple of months because I was sequestered in this locked office. The locked office, by the way, had a window, so everyone going by could see me that I was at the Times working away with papers and books piled high. So they, I, I couldn't make an excuse like I had a, a family emergency or I was going to be in the hospital or anything. I was there. My staff 
had no idea and were I not happy about being bombarded with questions by the news staff about what's going on. And uh, that was a problem for me. And yes, uh, I worked day and night, you know, till very late in the evening. So uh, it really cut off most of my social contacts, but that was all right. I really didn't care. I was so absorbed in my research for the Pentagon Papers. It was, it overwhelmed me and, and I wouldn't have had it any other way. Well, we're so proud of you and we're so grateful that you could be with us to talk about this on the 50th anniversary of the Pentagon Papers. For those of May you just, just joining us, yeah, I'm please. sorry to interrupt, but I wanted to tell you what I did for the Pentagon Papers, which was I was the only researcher and I was tasked with making sure there were no errors in what was printed. So everything that had to be checked for accuracy fell to me to check. In addition to which there were lots of things and the reporters didn't know whether they were still top secret or not and i was asked to find out if they had ever been published for that i had to go to the library at columbia university and go through their enormous archives of periodicals trying to find out whether this fact had ever been published or that fact it's very hard to find a negative so uh, i could never be really assured when i went back that it hadn't been published all i could say is i never found that it had been published. But at any rate, I'm proud to say there was never one error in the entire Pentagon paper. So that was that was what I was asked to do. That's Sorry what a what a great what, what a great story. And thank you for uh, sharing that part. Uh, one of the things obviously that became clear is that the government had mishandled the Vietnam War, had uh, lied not just to the public, but to Congress about various aspects of the war. And now when we look back, 78,000 American lives and countless lives in Vietnam and Southeast Asia were all lost. Do you, do you feel that, do you feel a sense of tragedy about the Pentagon Papers, about what it says about our government, our style of working, what the people were like at that time? Of course I do. I mean, it was ghastly to read the Pentagon. I didn't read the whole thing, of course, but in the installments, it was clear that there was so much obfuscation, so much lying uh, that the government was responsible for to continue the war it built on itself. And that's very troubling. And I'm sure it continues till today. I mean, uh, set, publishing the Pentagon Papers set a whole series of debates and commitments to principles and journalism that continue um, informing debates about the Snowden leaks, the Panama Papers, and so forth. So it continues today. It's still incredibly contemporary, even though it's 50 years old. And it will continue. I don't see uh, that it's going to end. There's, uh, that's my opinion. Hello? Uh, Patricia has a question. Uh, in a digital era, what advice would you give to a new generation regarding research? Well, a new generation, I'm so happy about the fact that fact checkers have become so important because of the Trump administration. Until then, presidents could say anything and had the confidence of the public. And even newspapers were wary of calling statements, uh, questioning statements. Thanks to Trump, a whole generation of fact checkers is on everything. So the Pentagon Papers will never happen again, ever. Famous last words, I suppose. But I really feel that I'm thrilled to see how fact checkers are now valued in a way they never were, they were anonymous before. Let's go to a couple of more photographs and then we'll get to the paper, get back to the paper. Tell us about this photo. Uh, this is when the Pentagon Papers won the Pulitzer Prize. This is a shot of the newsroom. 
that's Harrison Salisbury in the bow tie, and Bill Kovich at the national desk on the phone, and Jerry Gold way in the background. He's, uh, I, don't, I guess you can't see him, but he's behind Bill Kovich, and it's just a celebratory mood of the newsroom when it was announced. I thought it was a great shot. It, it is. Let's uh, keep going to another important story that you got to work on. Well, the research staff was asked, of course, did research for every department uh, on, in the news department, but about a week and a half before the moon landing, we were instructed to forget working on anything, but the issue that is, was going to be about walking on the moon. And the researchers were asked to compile every statistic possible about what the United States was like on a typical Sunday in July. Mm -hmm. And we were to use our imaginations on any statistic at all that we could find. So the entire research team devoted days and days to that. I personally called the census and asked if they could say how many births would be on a typical Sunday in the United States in July and how many deaths. And they said, well, we'd have to do a special census to get you that kind of information. Are you sure it will run? And I said, oh, absolutely. So they did a special census and we got uh, together, we compiled about an, oh, a vast, perhaps a thousand statistics of all kinds on the United States on a typical Sunday in July. And two days before the moonwalk, we were told to forget it, that they had changed their minds about it and they were going to instead send reporters to various parts of the countries like uh, an island off the coast of Maine, all over the country and have reporters file reactions from those places. And I said, but we, we have all these statistics. And they said, well, you can use one statistic. So we got together and decided uh, playfully the one statistic and it appears in that section and it is the number of square miles of skin covered by a suntan lotion in the United States on a typical Sunday in July. That was our revenge, <laughs> but it's in, in that section. But it also shows how quickly the Times adapted. It, it changed its course and decided, no, we're going to replace that with on on-site coverage by reporters of how typical Americans were celebrating the moonwalk. But it was, a, it was an interesting experience for all of us. And that was, of course, in, uh, that was, of course, in 1969. And can you just uh, tell us about that moment? Where were you when the, where, where were you watching the news? And how did you feel when man walked on the moon? Well, actually, I was working at the national desk helping with the coverage, sorting all the copy and being, you know, there for them. And uh, the man across from me, the editor across from me, got a phone call and he put it down and he said, there's real news, he said. Uh, Ted Kennedy is at Chappaquiddick. He was in a car accident. His car went into a pond. He escaped, but there's a woman in the car who drowned. And that was how we found out about Chappaquiddick. Uh, so that was a very dramatic moment in, in our coverage of that day. And it did run in the paper, not on the front page where it would have appeared any other day, but buried in the paper because it was really incidental to the moonwalk. So that was a, a, an interesting experience. I have not gone back to look at those dates. So I didn't realize that was the, that they coincided that way. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more with Linda about uh, her adventures at the Times, including uh, writing a book about corrections and uh, writing the Sun Saturday News Quiz and, and more. So uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. We have about 20 minutes left with Linda, and we've got to look at the paper. And so, uh, Linda, please jump in and feel free to uh, talk about any, any story that you see here as I, as I read them out loud. Feel free to jump in. Uh, as we do this. So I'm just going to pull up the uh, paper so everybody can see it here. And uh, the sports lead is about Martina Navratilova, still a pioneer at 64, 
has plenty on her mind. And she spoke up about uh, what happened this week with, um, with uh, Naomi Osaka. So it was great to uh, see her uh, there. So we're going to just keep going. And uh, Linda, you can pick what section we go through next. We have the Sunday review. We have uh, Sunday business and more. Where would you like to go? Well, I always read the review, of course, but a couple of things uh, that appeared re reminded me of things I had worked on. And so one of them, I believe, is in uh, Arts and Leisure, and it has to do with a ballet and the, uh, the emergence of lesbians uh, uh, in the ballet scene. Uh, uh, because heretofore, everyone, not everyone, but people generally knew that there were gay male ballet dancers, but did not know about lesbian dancers. And so um, that was just a secret, but it turned out, and it has now become evident according to the paper, that lesbian ballerinas are coming out. In fact, there's a photo of two of them in performance. And this is a relatively new phenomenon. It reminded me of uh, decades ago when one of our best reporters, Enid, Enid Nemi, uh, came to the desk and was in a panic because she wanted to know if I could find a lesbian that she could report. Lesbians were not prominently covered in those days and she needed to write a piece about lesbians. So of course I found a lesbian for her to call. <clears throat> and a few days later she came over with a letter and she was laughing and she said, I don't believe this, look at this. And it was a letter from a subscriber who was indignant. He said, I am furious at the New York Times. I was canceling my subscription of 20 years. I read your article about lesbians and I'm really outraged that you used a pseudonym, an anagram for the reporter of that, of that piece. He said, anyone can read that Enid Nemi is, is an anagram for I deny men. <laughs> and it certainly was. You could rearrange the letters of her byline, Enid Nemi, to read I deny men. Well, it was so funny, of course, that any reader would go to trouble of trying to find an anagram of her byline. But those were the days when one bylines about lesbians simply were on, you know, it was uh, an outrage. So that's a very old story about the, the first lesbian article. I don't think it, it may not have been the first, but it was the first one that called attention to the byline. The well, thank you for sure. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> another one in, in today's paper in the real estate section has to do with a brownstone in Brooklyn that is, it's in, that is going to sell for $30 million, uh, which would be a record high for the price of a brownstone in Brooklyn. And when I was a whippersnapper at the Times, the man who ran, who was the editor of the real estate section, Bob Alden, came up to me and said, would you like to write for the paper? I'd never thought about that, but I said, sure. And he said, I want you to go to Brooklyn and find houses, brownstones, that can be purchased for $25,000 or less. Those were the days. So I went to Brooklyn and sure enough, there were plenty and plenty of brownstones. You could buy beautiful brownstones for $25,000. I went and wrote an article and it ran across the top of the real estate section and featured a brownstone in Park Slope. And it sold for maybe $18,000. So uh, that, that shows how you should hold on to real estate. It's a good investment if you hold on to it long enough. And uh, so this, that was a going rate at the time, which was 1970. And today's $30 million uh, 
brownstone. I was intrigued by that. So those were two in today's paper that uh, resonated with me. Of course, um, the corrections resonated with me too. I always, I always look at corrections because uh, of course I, along with Dylan, um, edited a, a book of corrections, uh, as you can tell from the cover and the title, many of them were very amusing and many of them were quite serious. Uh, not knowing locations of countries, thinking that the reversing the Hudson and the East Rivers on the map, um, misspelling the, the name Salzberger, whose family owned the Times many, many times, quite an embarrassment, and <laughs> other very serious corrections. Um, we had a good time with it. And Al Siegel, who worked on the Pentagon Papers and later became an editor on the masthead, was kind enough to do the introduction. So that was a fun project that Dylan and I worked on together. Tell us about the the, the story at hand, uh, Kill Duck Before Serving. Well, Al, of course, looked through all of the corrections and he was taken by a correction having to do with a recipe, a recipe that appeared in the paper about uh, a roast duck, a fancy, fancy roast duck. It neglected to say, that the duck should be dead. And it was illustrated with a fancy centerpiece of a, uh, of a duck all adorned as a centerpiece. So the correction had to explain that the duck in question should be dead and should not be uh, illustrated as alive <laughs> as a centerpiece. <laughs> He loved that one, and we had it illustrated. Yeah, what a what a great cover! And so, the, <laughs> uh, and the, and the book is called "Kill Duck Before Serving: A Collection of the Newspaper's Most Interesting, Embarrassing, and Instructive Corrections." Red faces at the New York Times, and right. uh, I I certainly know that book. All right, let's keep going with the paper, uh, Sunday Review: The Making of a Doctor. This is about uh, how medical students graduated early to help hospitals and uh, found courage they didn't know they had. A important piece uh, by Tom Hanks writing in the paper, we should all learn about Tulsa and about how he as a well-read uh, young man knew nothing about Tulsa till a few years ago and the massacre that took place there. And we're marking the 100th anniversary this year. Uh, when living in California means staying inside, schools close and people are left clinging to their air purifiers when the air gets bad from wildfires. That, of course, is a problem in California. And uh, years ago, we used to talk about the smog in L.A. Uh, that was a regular story. Sorry, Frank Bruin, yeah, please may jump I in. May I something about doctors? Because that brings up another story of mine at the New York Times when I was a researcher there um, a long time ago when uh, Spiro Agnew was vice president, the rumor was that he had come to New York uh, on a weekly basis to be injected with amphetamines. Um, and I was asked to join <clears throat> the science staff in trying to confirm that. Unfortunately, the staff uh, found out that Ag the Agnew staff found out that we were on the trail of that, and that cut off that kind of research. But still, we had the name of the doctor, and the I was asked. There were a whole lot of names of people who might have used amphetamines, but we needed to confirm it. I was given a list of people who might have used them, when one of them was a man named Mark Shaw. His widow, Jerry Trotta, wrote for the Gourmet magazine, so I decided I would call her. And when I did, she said, oh yes, Mark went to Dr. Max Jacobson, and I still have in my medicine cabinet uh, a vial of the prescription that was issued. Would you like it? <laughs> Well, of course, I rushed over to get it, and I brought it back to the Times. And it was the smoking gun, because although we 
felt that Max Jacobson was behind all of this, we didn't have the evidence. And there it was, a vial prescribed by Max Jacobson to Mark Shaw for amphetamines. And it was analyzed by the Times and it was confirmed. But what made it particularly interesting was that Mark Shaw was the unofficial photographer of the Kennedy family. And he traveled with the Kennedy family, as did Max Jacobson. And so when Mark Shaw died, the uh, cause of death was supposed to be a heart attack. But when the Times came out, and exposed that John F. Kennedy had used amphetamines prescribed by Max Jacobson. That was an entirely different story, but it was linked to Mark Shaw and to the vial of pills. And there was another review of the cause of Mark Shaw's death, and it was shown that he died from amphetamine poisoning. So the whole thing went full circle. So with this story, of course, is about the training of good doctors, the story we worked on was about a bad doctor, but it was relevant to my career. And I actually got a, buy, uh, a credit line along with all the members of the science news department who worked on it. And my boss was very angry that I was credited because researchers weren't to be credited. That's just how it was in those days. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you're credited and thank you for telling us that story. Uh, Celia Duggar, who is the Times Health and Science Editor, has uh, told us that she'll be on our show as a guest in the months ahead, uh, probably in August or September. So hope folks will join us. Every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern, we read the Sunday New York Times with a guest. And today's guest is Linda Amster. And next week is Hedrick Smith, as we mark the 50th anniversary of the Pentagon Papers papers, uh, news report that told us uh, how badly the government was managing that war. We do have a quick question for you, uh, uh, Linda, that came in. Um, uh, this is from Paul Knox. The this discussion of the Pentagon Papers is fascinating. What, if anything, did the Pentagon Papers reveal about Kissinger's surreptitious work on behalf of the 68 Nixon campaign to disrupt the peace talks? between the Johnson and administration and the South Vietnamese. Was there anything regarding this event that, uh, which many consider treasonous that was known but not published by the New York Times? So just to remind folks, the story is that uh, Nixon worked behind the scenes to disrupt peace talks because he wanted uh, to make sure that Nixon got elected and therefore uh, scuttled the opportunity for peace back in 68. Um, any thoughts on this, Linda? Well, I, I, sorry, as I said, the Pentagon Papers uh, ended in Johnson's presidency in 1968. So the Nixon administration was spared any kind of uh, part of the Pentagon Papers, I'm sorry to say. I did want to add one thing about credits However, um, although I received a replica of the Pulitzer, on the day of the first installment, the Times ran credit, a credit on the front page of 22 of the most important people responsible for the Pentagon Papers. It started with the publisher. Everyone on the mast had 15 names. And then there were seven names of the people who actually worked on preparation of the paper, and they were all men, and my name was not among them. So, of course, I went to Jim Greenfield, and I said, what's the story here? And he said, well, you were a woman, and we thought we might all go to prison, and we, we didn't want you to go to prison. I reminded him that I had immediately said, I don't mind going to prison, but it was too late. I did not get credited. Such were the days before the feminist movement. Just wanted to add that. No, thank you for adding that. So basically, uh, it was kind of a patriarchal notion that you make you as a woman, you shouldn't be among the people potentially arrested. So they left you left you off the credit for that. Indeed, although I won a Pulitzer plaque for it, yeah, yes. showing, showing my value to the preparation of it. But yes, it was another another time. That's how women were treated. Uh, this is an essay by Viet Thanh Nguyen, who is an amazing 
writer and teacher. And he says, the flawed fiction of Asian American, we are marked by a contradiction between American aspiration and American reality. I'm looking forward to reading that. Uh, and this is that COVID crucible for new doctors. And this was, uh, this is about a book written by Emma Goldberg, who's an editorial assistant at the Times, who got a chance to go and spend a year with these new medical students who had newly graduated. Uh, Maureen Dowd column is ET phone home. It's about all of these UFO stories that we've been seeing. And Three Paths to Containing Trump is Ross Douthat's column. And Nick Kristoff, Turning Child Care into a New Cold War. Republicans talk a good game about families and then stiff them. You, of course, have seen, you know, one of the issues for women working in places like the Times and elsewhere was uh, how they were treated, how their families were treated, how much uh, opportunity women were given. And, uh, uh, and then here's a piece by Sasha Eisenberg, How We Got Fam Marriage Equality. And Sasha has a new book out, The Engagement, America's Quarter Century Struggle Over Same-Sex Marriage. And of course, you've seen so many changes over the years in many different ways. And you talked about uh, being assigned to find a lesbian for a quote in a story. Uh, again, tells you how much things have changed. The Sunday business cover is uh, the cost of being an interchangeable Asian and about how Asians, and I know other races as well, minority races are mistaken for other people in the in the office. I've had that happen to me. I work with another uh, person uh, who was Indian American and we we didn't look anything alike, but people would mistake us for each other all the time and use, I would be called his name and he would be called my name. Uh, are we waiting for everyone to get hacked? These ransomware stories are so disturbing. There's so much going on with that. Uh, very disturbing to um, see those stories. All right, we're going to go to the Sunday style section. This starts with a story about the Karistan rugs and uh, about TikTok. And there's so many uh, things in here. One of the things we learned is that the paper used for the Sunday style section is of higher quality. And I guess they were able to charge more for the ads. And uh, Korean grandparents test the age barrier. Lifted necks and other upgrades for guys. A lot going on there. Modern love column is a librarian who identifies as queer on our tendency to classify books and people. And uh, you had mentioned your interest in library sciences as part of your work as a researcher. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the paper is the social cues column by Philip Galanz. And um, I'm going to read one of the uh, etiquette questions and I'll ask you for your thoughts, Linda, but as you know, there are no right or wrong answers. So I'd love to hear what you say. Uh, gift return trap. When our twins were born, we were given generous baby gifts by many people, including my mother-in-law. Now that the twins are getting older, they're outgrowing their strollers, baby clothes, and car seats. So my husband has been selling gifts that were given to us by his side of the family for to buy new things. The problem, my mother-in-law recently asked us to return the bigger ticket item she gave us so her daughter can use them for the baby. Note, my sister-in-law isn't pregnant or in a serious relationship. I was taken aback by her requests. Gifts are gifts, right? So what would, what do you say, Linda, to that uh, etiquette question? Well, actually, uh, I'm of two minds, naturally. Uh, I probably in the same situation would have given the gifts to friends who needed them, considering that gifts are gifts. But I might have asked my mother-in-law whether she minded that I gave them away. In fact, I think probably the the better thing to do would have been to clear it with the mother-in-law, but uh, I can understand her just assuming that it would be all right for her to do it. So well, I, I think that's a very good, uh, good reaction. And here's part of what Philip says. You lay the responsibility of these sales at your husband's feet, but I suspect you agreed with his plan. So speak to his mother together. Tell her how much you appreciate her gifts. Acknowledge that you've been selling them as the twins outgrow them and assure her that the twins are were told uh, with each new purchase that their grandmother bought it for them. Maybe this will soothe some ruffled feathers. So that's a, uh, Etiquette questions are always thorny, as we know. I love and, that section, by the way. Yeah, yeah. tell us about, yeah, what do you do? Do you read the, 
uh, wedding announcements? Oh, sure. They're fascinating. I, I love that whole section. And of course, what's changed since your days at the Times is how much, uh, you know, now there are, of course, same-sex couples, more uh, couples that are interracial, and uh, not everybody is, you know, born into privilege who is here. They used to be, it used to be like that. Also, the term Ms. occurred while I, it used to be Mrs. or Miss. So that's how old I am that uh, after a long time, the, the times con conformed and, and started using Ms. Was there, was there a debate about that? How, how, did they, how did they agree to go to Ms.? There must have been debates because other, other publications used Ms. before the times did, but eventually the times did follow, on, follow up on that. Okay. Well, I'm not into any of the debates. No. Okay, we're, we're almost out of time. Uh, we're just going to glance at the book review, summer reading. So there's lots to read in here. Uh, uh, summer reading ideas, lots of books are, are listed in here. I'm sure people will would love to dig into that. So you can find that online. And the Times Magazine cover is about the Brooklyn Nets. And that's the genius, the moody, monkish genius of Kevin Durant and the uh, Brooklyn Nets. So for all basketball fans, this will be a, a, a sure uh, item to read. Uh, I love looking at ads, Linda, and here's a car I've never heard of called the Polestar. And it's a collector's item, polestar.com. I've never heard of this car and it's being advertised in the New York Times. And there's lots of other things to read in here. We won't have time to read the Times Magazine today, but I do want to just read some of the comments and get some final thoughts from Linda. Sujana Chandrasekhar uh, tells us that uh, uh, this still happens, men making decisions on behalf of women without their input. And she's talking about how you were not given credit where you could have been listed because you were a woman and you were told that they didn't want you to risk getting arrested, even though, of course, you uh, did so much of that work. And um, I also wanted to show you, I mean, show our audience uh, this uh, picture that you brought along of John Rothman. John was the man who hired me, and he is the unsung hero of information retrieval of newspaper coverage. Uh, John um, was the editor of the New York Times Index, which is, uh, was the only way of obtaining coverage of the Times <clears throat> before the internet. And he decided that there should be a, a, a way to use a computer to get coverage of the New York Times. A punch agreed and eventually he decided to introduce it into the newsroom. Uh, and it was through I was a re I was hired as a researcher as part of the team to introduce it to reporters, the male staff. But he deserves credit. Uh, he was like a pre-Google person who was uh, responsible for media coverage, including later on Washington Post and other newspapers by computer. So I give him a big hurrah. He died a few years ago but his legacy is enormous. And uh, you also uh, worked on the Saturday news quiz and you are showing here a news quiz where th this is this picture has been fixed, but the question was, I've never in my life, sir, ever received any legal money, said the man pictured above. I've had to work very hard for my money, thank you. Who is he and what were the circumstances? And this was in 1981, Frank Sinatra, but they put the picture of the pug instead, right? That's what happened here. What they did was uh, switch the, the question. So the one, the other photo was of the dog that won the Westminster Kennel show, <laughs> uh, a pug. And some mischievous man, I believe, in the composing room switched the captions so that the one under Sinatra said, the pug pictured above has reason to be smug. <laughs> so the, you're it, saying this happened on purpose. This was a oh, yes. sabotage. There was, there was someone who deliberately switched the caption so that Sinatra became the pug. <laughs> I thought I would end my days <laughs> at the times through something <laughs> Sinatra would do.
But in a later edition, they put the captions back in place. So luckily, the final <laughs> edition had the proper captions uh, under the pictures. <laughs> All right. Before we let you go, I want to remind everyone that we have been talking to Linda Amster, who is a longtime researcher at the Times, and she worked on the Pentagon Papers, the moon landing, and so much more. Living, she got a chance to live all this great history. And she's part of a two-part series that we're doing about the 50th anniversary of the Pentagon Papers. Next Sunday at 8.30 a.m., the Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter uh, who was at, uh, who worked on the Pentagon Papers among, with others, uh, Hedrick Smith, will be with us. And he, he wrote the best-selling book, The Russians and the Power Game, and I read both books when I was a young journalism student. And he'll be with us at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time next Sunday. Uh, before we give Linda a chance for a final thought, we want to tell folks that at 11 a.m. Eastern, our friends Sujana Chandrasekhar and Marina Kurin, uh, two surgeons, are going to be hosting an episode, an episode of She's On Call, all about LGBTQ health. And so please join us for that at 11 a.m. Eastern time on She's On Call on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc. And we want to thank our amazing producers for uh, being with us, Paula Kiger at Big Green Pen, Carla Baranakis at Kabara, Steve Taylor at Steve DeReeve, and Julia Weeks, Julia L. Weeks. Our executive producer, Neil Parikh, is busy elsewhere today producing a show, uh, at, uh, and he is named, uh, Linda, I don't know if he told you this, but Neil Parikh is named after Neil Armstrong. Uh, his father was so inspired by the moon landing that he named his son uh, after Neil Armstrong. And we want to thank uh, Carla, uh, and for producing this incredible weekly newsletter she writes called The Local Connection. Subscribe for local weekly story ideas, how to take big stories and make them local for local reporters. Bitly slash local news tips, bit.ly slash local news tips. I make all my students subscribe to it. And I think every journalist should be reading this. It'll show you how to take national, international stories and how to localize it. Uh, so please subscribe bit.ly slash local news tips. So now let's go back to Linda for a couple of final thoughts. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Sri, for so adroitly handling everything when I was unable to be interviewed. And I want to give special thanks to Carla, who was, was so invaluable with her support and her suggestions uh, in making this possible. And I hope that the audience got a, 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 an inside view of working on the Pentagon Papers, which I value so much, and also about coverage at the Times in the pre-feminist era, which, which thank goodness no longer exists. Um, just a little peek into bygone days at the New York Times. Thanks very much. Is this, uh, some of the things that surprise us, like the Times didn't use Ms. till 1986. Until then, I guess they would have to track down the marital status of every woman and say, is it Miss or Mrs.? What a, what a no, pain. No, that's not true. They didn't, then? Th 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 that was automatically given when, uh, when they, uh, they didn't have to track it down, but it was never, now they have to track it down. The policy is, if you don't want to be known as Ms., please tell us what your preference is. But so it's automatically a Ms. now. And before then, it was automatically a Miss or a Mrs., depending on whatever the person wanted. Ms. But how did people know? How did the reporter know if it was a Miss or a Mrs.? Would ask. Okay. So and, anytime and they wrote about a woman, they would ask, what is your marital status? Yes, yes. Okay. It was just automatic. <laughs> well, Jonathan says, fascinating backstory. Thank you. And Eve says, very interesting session. So thank you so much, Linda. We're very grateful to you uh, for your time on a Sunday morning. And I look forward to connecting in real life. We're neighbors, but we've never <laughs> met. Maybe we'll see each other at Trader Joe's. No uh, doubt about that. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and Ellen says, fabulous program. The Pentagon Papers are so important, we must not forget. I would love more on this. And in fact, you will. Next Sunday, Hedrick Smith will be with us. One, uh, who worked on the Pentagon Papers, and we'll talk more about the 50th anniversary. June 13th is the anniversary date of the Pentagon Papers, so that's the 50th anniversary. So thank you so much, Linda, and to our audience. Thank you, as always, for watching. 
This show will air right away, replay on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. So just tag a friend, tell them to watch, and they can watch right away. And thank you again, Linda, and thank you, everybody, for watching. Goodbye, everyone.